Greetings all, Shard Vixen here. Okay, take five. <laughs> so this is History's Greatest Mysteries. Um, remember in Brain Food, which comes after what does the Vixen say, um, in the stream of my blogs, I'll go through each one of these. We're probably on like 47, I guess, or something, so it'll be a while. But I research them and look them up and see what there is, and then I make my comments on it and review it kind of thing what I think then you guys can leave a message and say what you think when I'm done with this with what does a vixen say which I'm hoping will be this time around I'm going to uh, start doing some readings as well as the rest of my things I do for what does a vixen say question like style stuff um, I'm gonna read comic books and maybe some of my writing all right so here we go number 15 Sightings of mysterious unidentified flying objects, UFOs, are not a modern phenomenon. There are even aboriginal cave paintings that appear to represent alien visitors. But during the 1940s, there was a surge of interest in alien life, a fascination that began on June 24, 1947, when pilot Kenneth Arnold reported seeing nine glowing objects flying in a V formation over Mount Rainier in Washington. Arno estimated that the UFOs, which he believed to be 45 to 50 feet wide, were flying at speeds of up to 1,700 miles per hour after they were seen flying between two mountains spaced 50 miles apart in just one minute, 42 seconds. Arno's sighting caused a media sensation. I'm sorry I'm tilted here because i got to look through my glasses. Um, and became the catalyst for similar reports of UFO activity across the U.S. Theories about the origins of objects rain from a meteorite breaking up as it hit the Earth's atmosphere is simply pelicans flying in formation. I'd be freaked out about glowing pelicans. What do you guys think? Um, okay, number 14. Also, lately I've been having more and more problems with pronunciation of stuff. Uh, part of it's the cognitive fog, and then the other part of it is um, my processing disorder, which I have problems in recognizing letters and sounds and putting them together and stuff like that. Reading is not a challenge for me because I was learned to memorize read, but sounding out reading is a challenge. And then once I try to grab onto a word, I just, I lose it. Lately, a pheromone, I can hear it in my head, but I can't say it, which is the stuff that you put in journals. It has an actual name, which is... <laughs> intriguing to me now I'm at the hiccups I've just I've had nothing but problems trying to do this blog a vlog can't even say what it is okay one of the seven wonders of the ancient worlds this is number 14 hanging gardens of Babylon um, have been are said to have been built by King Neba Dem Yucha Azara II, ruler of Babylon for 44 years from 605 BC to cheer up his home sec wife, Amistus of Me King Neb built an artificial mountain with rooftop gardens. The gardens probably didn't hang in the way we would understand. The name comes from the NX translation of Greek word kermastos, which actually means overhanging. The huge tiered garden is said to have been 400 feet wide by 400 feet long and more than 80 feet high were an incredible sight filled with all manner of plants. Yet no trace of them has ever been found in Babylon and there are no surviving Babylonian texts that mention them. Some historians believe the garden were actually sighted 350 miles south of Babylon in Nivaren in today's central Iraq. No thorough research of the area has been possible, so the garden's location remains a his mystery. Interesting. I wonder why you can't go there. They just don't want you searching the secrets of Iraq. Uh, Thirteen. Easter Island. Okay, this is like a in search of kind of one. I remember this one. I remember my mother was very interested in this. But my mom's very interested in archaeologist stuff. Okay, about 2,200 miles from the west coast of Chile and 2,600 miles east of Tahiti, it lies Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, as it is commonly known, so named by Dutch explorers to mark the one day they arrived, on, mark the day they arrived in 1722. Some 63 miles in size, Rapa Nui is famous for the near 900 giant stone bus known as Moi. Maui? Maui. If I mispronounced that, I apologize. Please let me know. Send me a 
phonetic spelling of it. That's the best way. Because then I'll correct it, or I'll try as best as I can. The litter that litter the island. Averaging 4 meters high and weighing 13 tons, the enormous figures are believed to have been carved by Polynesian settlers between 1400 and 1650. But what purpose did such a vast army of stone heads have, and how were they constructed and transported? One theory is that they were representations of the indigenous people's ancestors carved each time an important tribal figure passed away. Excavations have revealed that Easter heads actually have bodies. Wouldn't they be, not Easter heads, but Rap Rapa Nui's heads? Actually have bodies that have become buried over the centuries. Okay, 12. Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> An ornate glittered case built some 3,000 years ago to house the two stone tablets on which Moses had written the Ten Commandments. The Bible describes the Ark of the Covenant as the size of a, a 19th century seaman's chest, about 45 inches long. Um, let's see where I was at. About 45 inches long, 27 inches high, and 27 inches wide, gold-plated, topped with two golden angels. Stories of the Ark's powers are plenty. At one point, it was captured by the Philistines, who were allegedly forced to keep moving it around after mice and hemorrhoids struck the city to, to which it was taken. I don't know why they had to move it around with mice and hemorrhoids. It's not like the case was going to get hemorrhoids. Maybe mice would be a problem, but if they're stone tablets, what's the issue? I've not met any mice to eat stone as of yet. I mean, there might be out there. There's snails that eat plastic. Uh, but the Ark disappeared from the records in 597 when the Israelites were conquered by the Babylonian Empire. Some believe it is hidden in Askum, Asum, Ethiopia, in the Cathedral of St. Mary of Zion. Others claim it, it, it lies hidden in the Warren of Passages between the First Temple and Jerusalem. In 1982, archaeologist Ron Wyatt believed, claimed he found the ark buried beneath the hill on which Christ was crucified, but he was unable to provide proof, and the mystery as to the ark's whereabouts still remains. Indiana Jones found it, then hid it, then found it. <laughs> a couple of places, a couple of stories come up that way. I'm joking. Eleven. Um... Tagusta Explosion. On June 30, 1908, a fireball 50 to 100 meter wide streaked across the sky above a forest near... Okay, I'm going to mess this up, and I apologize to you. Podkamananaya Tagusta River in Siberia. Some 80 miles... Some 80 million trees across the 770 square mile area were flattened in the blast. This one was also an in search of, I'm thinking. Wildlife was reduced to smothering carcasses and a shockwave knocked people off their feet and shattered windows in towns hundreds of miles away. Eyewitnesses reported observing a light almost as bright as the sun and heat so intense it felt as if clothing was on fire. The sky was split in two and high above the forest the whole northern part of the sky appeared covered with fire, said one observer. But what caused the so-called Tanuska event, a force that produced 185 times more energy than an atomic bomb at Hiroshima in 1945? Many are convinced it was an asteroid that disintegrated at between 3 to 6 miles above the Earth, which would explain why no crater was ever been found. Other theories include an alien spaceship crash. Remember, you guys can always put down what you think the reasons are, right? Okay, 10. Jack the Ripper. Uh, this one has so many stories. People have written so many stuff about it. I just find the whole thing very interesting. Um, says Jack the Ripper has also been known as Leather Apron. Le Prince Albert Victor was linked to the crimes. Yeah, that's what I had heard. That's the, the most recent thing I had heard. I don't remember where I heard it from, though. Um, Jack the Ripper is Britain's most notorious serial killer, an individual who, between 31 August, August 31 and December 31st, 
I don't know why I read it that way. 1888 stalked the streets of London's East End, murdering and mutilating at least five women. The first victim was 42-year-old prostitute Mary Ann Nicholas, whose throat was slashed twice and stomach ripped open. A week later, on September 8th, the Ripper claimed his second victim, another prostitute, Annie Chapman. Her head was nearly severed and her bladder taken as a trophy. Panic stripped swept through Whitechapel, the site of both murders. Over the next two months, three more women were brutally murdered. The last, 25-year-old Mary Jeanette Kelly, was found with her throat cut, her nose and breast cut off, and dumped on the table alongside her heart. Many suspects have been put forward, among them lawyer Montaiga John Druitt, whose body was found in the Thames on December 31, 1980. 1888. Could his death explain why the killing suddenly stopped? Experts believe the killer to be someone who possessed skills with a knife, perhaps a doctor or a butcher. One theory even linked Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Victor, to the crimes, although there is little evidence for this. To this day, the Ripper has never been identified. Well, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, so... But it is an, it, it's one of the most interesting ones because of the fact that it actually was seen as a serial killer. I don't know if it was seen as a serial killer then. And if people really cared all that much because they were prostitutes. That was always a theory that came across too. Okay, so number nine, copper scroll treasures. Part of the cache, uh, cache of first century documents known as the Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in 11 kegs at Quamran near the northern edge of the Dead Sea between 1947 and 1956. The copper scroll has often been described as the most important and the least understood. The only text to have been written on the metal, copper mixed with about 1% tint, could be unrolled conventionally could be, could not be unrolled conventionally so in 1955 it was cut into 23 strips and pierced back together dating to between AD 25 to 100 the copper scroll contained directions to 64 locations where immense quanti quantities of treasure could be found a total haul of more than a billion dollars 42 Talons lie under the stairs in the salt pit. Sixty-five bars of gold lie on the third terrace in the cave of the old washer's house. And so on it went. Hunts for the listed treasure became almost immediately, began almost immediately, but the scroll's lack of detail has meant no one has ever found any of it. Had the treasure already been looted, or is it still buried and waiting to be found? Oh, I never heard of that one. Interesting. What we'll to look? That'll be cool to look into. Um... I don't know. Number eight, the Fiesta Fe, Fiestos disc. Fiestos disc. Discovered at the palace site of Fiestos on the Greek island of Crete in 1908, the fire clay and height. The fire clay Fiestos disc is believed to date to 1700 BC. The height of the Minonan. I know that civilization. Some 16 centimeters in diameter and about 1 centimeter thick, experts have been studying the disc for centuries trying to decipher the unknown language described on its front and the reverse. Many believe the disc's 241 symbols are meant to be read in a spiral direction from the outside edge inwards. Uh, and one researcher believes he's identified three words that may translate to pregnant, pregnant mother, goddess, or shining mother. However, other experts remain unconvinced with some even proposing the disc is in fact an elaborate hoax. Either way, we may never discover its true meaning. Because we can't just admire things, right? Number seven, Bermuda Triangle. I knew, I was wondering when this one was coming. Okay. So, uh, covering about 500... Th thousand square feet square miles of ocean off to the southern eastern tip of Florida. The Bermuda Triangle or the Devil's Triangle as it is also known has been several has seen several ships and aeroplanes disappear in mysterious circumstances over the centuries. And the triangle is more than just a modern phenomenon. Christopher Columbus, when traveling through the area on his first trip in the New World in 1492, wrote of a great flame that crashed into the sea there and of strange lights appearing in the distance. Even Shakespeare was sufficiently intrigued by the Bermuda Triangle, with some believing his play The Tempest to be to have been written about a real Bermuda Triangle shipwreck. Over the past century alone, the triangle has blamed, 
has been blamed for disappearances of at least 20 planes and 50 ships. One of the most famous mysteries of the Bermuda Tangle is the disappearance of the five TB of the five TBM Avenger to pro, to, torpedo bombers on December 5, 1945. All 14 men involved disappeared without a trace, as well as the Mar Martin Mariner's flying boat and its 13-man crew that went in search for him. Conspiracy theories have proposed a number of possible causes for the disappearances, including paranormal activity, giant structures under the seabed causing crashes, and even that the triangle comprises the souls of African slaves thrown overboard during their journey from Africa to the U.S. Other more plausible theories include anomalies in the Earth's magnetic field causing equipment to malfunction or hexagonal cloud formations capable of casting 170 mile mile per hour winds and waves more than 45 feet high. Okay. Number six. Loch Ness Monster. Now, In Search Of did this one. Also the Bermuda Triangle. These are the ones that I remember as a kid in this, you know, in the 70s and 60, uh, 80s. Um, these being talked about. Scotland's most famous resident, the legend of the Loch Ness Monster, or Nessie as it is affectionately known, goes back hundreds of years to its first recorded sighting on August 22nd, 565 by St. Columbia. Since then, there have been more than a thousand recorded sightings of a supposed prehistoric creature living beneath the waters of Loch Ness in the Scottish Highlands. The first purported photographs of Nessie's head and neck were taken by London gynecologist Robert Kenneth Wilson in 1934. The photo garnered a great deal of interest and was published in the Daily Mail, but it is now widely dismissed as a hoax. In 1962, dedicated Nessie hunter Tim Densdale helped set up the Loch Ness Phenomenon Investigation Bureau, which is used as everything from airborne searches to echo sounds, sounders, hot air balloons, sonar, infrared cameras, and submarines to investigate the creature's existence. The year 1977 saw magician and psychic Anthony Shells claims that he had summoned the monster out of the water and taken a photo of it, while in 2007 a videotape emerged that appeared to show a black object about 14 meters long moving through the waters of the loch. Nesting sightings continue to be roading reported with seven sightings record in 2016 but what really lurks beneath the still waters of Loch Ness it's a dragon guys a dragon I'm convinced of that it's a dragon since I was a kid because I believe dragons are real I just don't think we can see them uh, they hide really well into the thing I'm sure there's no evidence for that of course so that's a, just a fanciful crazy thing on my part okay number five King Arthur. I told you this one's going to go a little longer. I was wondering if King Arthur was going to show up in this. I don't know why it's considered a mystery, though. I mean, we just don't know much about him. The, uh, the fifth, the, a fifth to sixth century royal palace in Tidago, Tidago, I know that word, Tintagel, Tintagel, the site where Arthur is said to have been conceived was discovered in 2016. See, if you just wait, things keep coming up. The legendary figure of King Arthur, the Roman Celtic leader, is said to have defended Britain against the Saxon invaders in the late 5th to early 6th century, is one that still leaves historians divided. Details of Arthur are sketchy. He appears in folklore and literature, but hard evidence of his existence is distinctly lacking, leading some to wonder if he ever existed at all. The earliest reference to Arthur is in a poem dating from the 7th to the 11th century. E. That's a Y. God, God, I don't think I pronounced this right. I don't even know how the connecti Celtic pronunciation, unless I heard it. It's G-O-D-O-D-D-I-N. I'll put it up here. I'm going to say God, God, Odanen, Godadanen, which contains a elegy to author. Three other historian documents, Geoffrey of Monomoth's 12th century, Historia Regama Brit Britannia, the 10th century Annals of Cambrai, and the 9th century Historia Brigga, Brita, Britam, all cite Arthur as being a real person, linking him to several battles of the time. Yet Arthur appears to be exclusive, 
excluded from other historical accounts, leading many historians to believe he's simply a fictional hero. Nonetheless, believers continue to search for Arthur's burial place, as well as the site of the fictional castle, Camelot, and the famous round table. I think those are more fictional than Arthur. I think people have changed those up. All right, I was wondering when this one would show up. I, Ronoco, I think it's Ronoco, but I'm not sure. Colony, that's number four. Uh, a map of the colonist John White depicting the Virginia coast of Ronoco at the mouth of the river. <clears throat> the first English settlement in the New world, world, the Ronoco Island Colony, was founded by explorer Sir Walter Riley in August 1585. Sighted in what is now Dares County, North Carolina, the colony was set up on the orders of Elizabeth I, but after suffering dwindling food supplies and Indian attacks, Native American attacks, I don't like the word. Food supplies and Indian... Nope. Food supplies and Native American attacks, the community returned to England in 1586. A second attempt to colonize was made in 1587 with 115 settlers led by an Englishman named John White. John White set foot on American soil. Just a few weeks after their arrival, White's granddaughter became the first baby born in the New World to English parents. The future seemed bright. Later that year, White returned to England to procure supplies for the colony, but was unable to return to America until August 1590, thanks to a war between England and Spain. When White did finally return to the settlement on his granddaughter's birthday of August 18th, he found it completely empty. With no traces of the colonists he had left and no sign of violence, the only clue to their whereabouts, included, including his own daughter and granddaughter, was the word Coronto carved into a Palestine, Palestade, Palestade that had been built around the complex. Assuming this meant that his men and women had moved to Coronton Island, now Hatteras Island, some 60 miles away, White Initiated search, but problems with the ship and bad weather forced him off coast. White eventually left for England, and the mystery remains as to what happened to his family and friends. One theory, based on tree ring data from Virginia, is that an extreme drought hit the area between 1587 and 1589, contributing to the demise of the, demise of the colony, although this doesn't explain where they went. Another theory is that the colonists were absorbed into a Native American tribe known as the Croatans. Who knows? But I will search. We will research it and see what all comes up now. Um, I, I found it. I found it interesting. But I mean, that's a time period where people could just disappear. I mean, people disappear now, right? They just and no one sees them ever again. Like that's it. Number three, the lost island of Atlantis. Since it was first mentioned by the ancient Greek philosopher Plato in his dialogues Tim Timenus and Curitus, the lost island of Atlantis has continued to intrigue. In his writings composed in 360-347 BC, Plato describes Atlantis as a powerful scientifically advanced community that was cast to the ocean floor in just one day and night after its people fell out of favor with the gods following a war with Athens. Plato describes the island as being bigger than Libya and Asia Minor put together with a location in the Atlantic just beyond the pillars of Hercules, the two rocks that mark the entrance to the Straits of Gibraltar. The mythical island dropped off the radar until 17th century when philosopher and science Francis Bacon revived the topic with his utopian novel, The New Atlantis, in 1882. <clears throat> oh, the New Atlantis. In 1882, former U.S. Congressman uh, Donnelly, I don't know, his first part of his name is, woo, right out there, Ignatius, Ignatius, Ignatius L. Donnelly, sparked a number of hunts for the lost island with his, antle his, with his atlas, the Antedevillian world, but no concrete evidence for its existence has ever been found. The idea of an island containing an advanced utopian society of wisdom and peace, as the Atlas, as Atlantis came to be known, continued to fascinate 
in literature and film, and many still believe Plato's writings to be based on fact. One theory proposes that the island fell victim to a notorious Bermuda Triangle. That's odd. Another claims that the story of the Atlas Atlantis is that the Minoan, there we go back, M-I-N-O-A-E-N, I'm going to put that up there, civilization that flourished on the Greek islands of Crete and Thera, now Santonian, before a huge, before a huge volcanic eruption in 1600 B.C. exploded millions of tons of rock, ash, and gas into the atmosphere and possibly wiped out the Minona cities throughout the region. Ugh, that was hard. I don't know why that one's hard. Okay, number two, the Holy Grail. Well, makes you wonder what number one is then. There are some 200 goblets across Europe vying for the title. It says, Glastrobury's Tor is thought to be the possible location of the Grail. The Chalice of Dora Uraca has been dated to around the time of Jesus. Said to be the cup from which Christ drank the last at the Last Supper and the vessel that received the blood that flowed from his side during the crucifixion, the Holy Grail is still the most sought after Christian Christian relic. A holy chance, ch chalice is referred is referenced in the Bible, but it wasn't until the 12th century that the story of the Grail became tied up with that of King Arthur. In a poem written between 1181 and 1190, one of the knights of the round table visits a mysterious castle where the Grail is being guarded by the Fisher King. The writer credited a source book, but the original work remains a mystery. Other writers then continue to develop the concept, according to another 12th century poem, Joseph de Aramati, by French writer Robert de Boron. The Grail was brought to Glastro Glastonbury, England, by Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy Juden, Juden who supposedly recovered Jesus' body after the crucifixion. It was then buried somewhere nearby. The water is said to run red at the site of the burial. In 2014, two Spanish researchers claimed they had already found the grail, a 2,000-year-old jewel-encrusted onyx chalice known as the Chalice of Dona Eureka, Eureka, which has been kept at the Ballistic of Santa Isadora, Isidora? Isidora, in Lyon, Spain, since the 11th century. According to the pair, the chalice was transported to Cairo by Muslim travelers before coming into the possession of Ferran Ferdinand I of Lyon. Historians received unconvinced Historians remain unconvinced, pointing out that there are some 200 goblets across Europe vying for the title of Holy Grail. One other theory is that the Grail is actually held at the U.S. Bullion Depository in Fort Knox, Kennedy, perhaps the most secure building on the planet. According to legend, behind the building's 22-ton steel door and multiple security measures lies lies in a special room which houses the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, and the True Cross. That sounds like uh, Indiana Jones again. Never heard of that one. Okay, and then the last one is... Not that. <clears throat> the last one is Stonehenge. I don't know why that makes number one, but okay. I was thinking there's some other mysteries out there that are more like, what the heck? But okay. Today's stone circle is a masterpiece of Neolithic engineering. Neolithic, sorry, engineering. But the first monument of Stonehenge was a circular earthwork enclosure built in about 3000 BC and dug with a simpler antler tools. Some 56 timber or stone posts were then erected inside the ditch and the site was used for cremation ceremonies. But it was in around 25... BC that the stone monument we know today was constructed comprising large sarsen stones and smaller stones known as blue stones. 
For centuries, the scientists and the archaeologists were puzzled on how such huge stones were transported to Salisbury Plain before the invention of the wheel. The sarsen stones, the largest of which weighs 30 tons, are sandstone and thought to have been brought from Mel Marlborough, bro? Marlborough, Marlborough. I know that downs 220 miles away from Stonehenge, but the smaller blue stones are believed to have originated in southwest Wales, 150 miles away, a huge distance to move such large objects. Some archaeologists believe the stones were transported by moving glaciers, but human effort via water and land is now thought to be more likely. A system of wooden A-frames weights timber platforms and plant fiber ropes were then used to raise the stones into place together with precisely interlocking joints unseen by any other prehistoric monument. The main axles of the stones is aligned upon the winter solstol I don't know how to say that solstitial solstitial axis meaning that at the summer solstice, the sun rises over the horizon to the northeast, close to the largest stone, while at the winter solstice in December, it sets in the southwest. These two dates, it is believed, were of particular significance to those who built and used Stonehenge, and radiocarbon dating on animal remains found near the site was revealed that Pigs were slaughtered in December or January every year, which suggests an annual ritual around the time of winter solstice. The, the site proposes. <laughs> I'm sorry. The site proposes that intrigued, intrigued people for centuries. Sorry. The site's purpose has intrigued people for centuries. The oldest known depiction of depiction of Stonehenge shows Merlin placing one of the top stones in place. In 1663, physician Walter Charlton claimed that Stonehenge was built by early medieval Danes as a site for their kings to be coronated. Meanwhile, philosopher and writer John Aubrey, who surveyed the monument in around 1640, believed Stonehenge was the temple built by and for the Druids. Other possible uses include a center for healing and a place of pilgrimage for the Neolithic sick. Indeed, human activity at the site predates the stones by some 4,500 years, and charcoal dating to 700,000 B.C. has been unearthed at Stonehenge, a site of human activity. It may even have been a huge burial site for high-status people with the stones serving as grave markers. I don't think they found anything. Okay, so I think that's it. Or that yep that's it so we're all done the stones it says yep okay so I'm gonna look into all these some shorter than others I'm sure um, and like I said this one was a little long so I apologize that I will edit as much as possible um, I will be back next week with brain food I think we are doing I don't remember which one we're doing um, the ghost blimp no, let's see, we went 48, 49. the Lost Regiment, that's the next one we do, there isn't much on them, it's interesting how the, the smaller, the bigger numbers have smaller amounts, and the, the number one was like a huge page and everything, anyway, so, um, that's it, and I'll catch you all on the flip side, I'm out of here, peace, I'm sorry, I rambled on really fast, I hope you were able to catch all that, anyway,